So hello everyone, I'm uh, Jasper and I'm here with uh, Cedric and Emmanuel uh, from the University of Versailles. Uh, we work primarily on the Macau tool for uh, performance analysis and optimization. And uh, I'll be taking you actually uh, uh, on a tour around what can Macau do for you and uh, the kind of analyses that we uh, we perform actually to obtain the, the performance profiles and eva evaluation actually of the performance that we, uh, we managed to bring up. So to begin, we're going to start by um, presenting a certain number of questions that when you engage into the performance optimization and analysis process uh, might help you actually uh, navigate the, the muddy waters of binary analysis or maybe just performance analysis. So in general, when you start, um, you be start with begin with an algorithm that you're going to turn into an implementation using a programming language. Um, and certain maybe parallel paradigms, uh, maybe you're going to use MPI, OpenMP, shared uh, memory versus uh, distributed memory. Then once you finish the development process, you compile your program and then you obtain a binary file, so an executable that you're going to run on, the, on the, the machine. So it does actually the problem solving tasks that it, it was, uh, it was um, meant to be solving actually. So in this pipeline, you're going to have multiple steps. So these are just major steps that we have uh, summarized in here. But um, in reality, they're pretty complicated because just choosing the proper algorithm is just another, uh, it's, it's a very, very complicated step. And then when you move to the implementation, there are so many variables actually that can uh, impact not only the performance, but also the uh, portability of the code, the maintainability of the code, and so on. So they're difficult decisions that need to be made throughout this whole pipeline. And then when you move to the compilation process, you have to know the compiler and you have to know the environment where you, you go into uh, generate the binary file. So if you don't have a certain amount of uh, mastery over what the compiler can do for you and a certain amount of understanding of, uh, of what the compiler actually uh, is doing, uh, you're going to have issues gaining the performance or getting the performance that you, you're targeting on the, the machine that you are, you're, want to run actually your, your binary on. And then once you execute the program, uh, problems that you have maybe never imagined possible just while writing the code uh, might pop up. So you should be able to actually also verify whether the execution of your program is going according to uh, what has been expressed at the source level. So these uh, four main steps are quite uh, difficult, but what we try to do in Macau with Macau is, is actually provide um, information at different layers. Well, we're not going to uh, intervene at the algorithmic layer because this is uh, something that only humans can do for now. But when it comes to the implementation, compilation, and execution, those are uh, quite um, I would say easy to attack, but the task is not easy. Getting uh, valuable information out of each and every one of um, of those steps, from each and every one of those steps is pretty complicated. Uh, but that's the only part actually where we can automate uh, as much as possible and, and, and do a lot of work uh, that programmers and performance uh, engineers are not really interested in doing by hand. Um, so one of the main questions that uh, you might ask yourself actually um, when you start optimization process is how much of your application can be optimized? And what is the uh, return on investment if you perform those optimizations? Um, I mean, applications, they, in general, uh, solve a problem using some, some code patterns that are nothing but expressions of mathematical equations or physics equations and so on. But the idea behind this is once you have that whole application working, where within that application you need to spend the most time trying to gain actually uh, performance. Uh, there might be spots where you have input output uh, to the disk or to the network uh, and other maybe code patterns doing access to memory and so on. So you have to be able to figure out how much time is spent in each and every one of those parts and whether those parts are optimizable and how much optimizations can be deployed at that point. But then the most important thing is when you deploy an optimization or before you do so, uh, you have to know whether it is worth it to do uh, or not. Because that's the, the point here is spend less time and gain as much as possible actually uh, uh, 
during the, the optimization and performance analysis process. And then once you figure out actually um, where the application spends most of its ex execution time, the next question, the obvious question is why? So that requires actually some more digging. So um, the basic questions that come after that one is uh, again, going deeper into the uh, uh, diagram that you see on the right. I mean, should we look at the algorithm? Should we look at the implementation? Maybe the programming language is not suitable. Maybe the parallelization paradigm is not suitable. Uh, or is it the runtime? Or maybe is it the hardware that is not uh, suitable? There might be bugs sometimes in, in the hardware. There might be uh, firmware updates that uh, will retrograde some, some particular parameter within the hardware. So one should be very careful actually when doing performance analysis and do not leave anything actually uh, out of suspicion. So everything should be in a certain way uh, investigated. And also the major point is, are we spending time uh, within an application doing data access or doing computation? Uh, we all know that modern machines are better at doing computation than data access. So uh, the better data flows and the faster it flows into the comput computation units, the better it is. So this requires actually some additional uh, care and we should dig into the, the, I mean, the computational or data access aspect of the, the application uh, in great detail. And we'll see this actually in the next slides in great detail. And then the last question that you, you have uh, most likely on your mind once you figured out actually uh, uh, all the information about your application regarding the previous questions, it's how to improve now the application. What kind of optimizations, what kind of modifications should I do in the compilation pipeline at the source code level to gain more performance, meaning that having the code run faster or uh, do more work in the same amount of time as before. Um, so you have to figure out at which step you have to intervene. In general, the best um, possible, I would say, step in this diagram is to intervene at the source code level. So if you can do as much as possible, well, try to do it uh, at the source code level. And then you have the compilation process where you can actually communicate with the compiler uh, a lot of information that can help it uh, understand your needs with regard to the uh, target architecture and then maybe generate a much better code than if it was not given actually enough information about the, the code itself. And that's where things actually uh, come to play with Macau is we will bring a certain amount of information up that might help you actually tune the compilation process. I mean. You'll see later on that we can go even deeper into uh, providing actually uh, uh, what to do exactly to, to gain performance in certain cases. Um, but the general idea here is to uh, actually attack this multifaceted problem by going step by step and um, through an el elimination process, actually. So the first thing we do is try to pinpoint the performance bottlenecks, um, understand where is the application spending time, then understand why it is spending time actually over there, uh, try to relate that to maybe the algorithmic choice or the implementation uh, code patterns, or maybe even the choice of, uh, of, of paradigm when it comes to parallelism. And the other point is how can we make best use of the underlying machine uh, features? So you have modern CPUs with multi-core and many-core uh, architectures. Uh, we have different memory hierarchies now, multiple cache levels and different types of memory, HBM and DDR5 and so on. And you have actually, most CPUs now come with vector units. So SIMD is, is quite a, it's quite an important actually uh, architectural point that needs to be uh, emphasized on more and more. But the problem is there is an issue between uh, the expressiveness of, of SIMD and also what compilers can do actually at a higher level. So we'll see this actually in detail with a motivating example later on. So the last point here is also to be able to guide the uh, performance analysis process or the uh, performance analysis uh, into understanding which are the most rewarding issues to be fixed. So once you have figured out actually the points where your application is, is spending time, uh, I mean, the, the code blocks where it's spending time. You understood the underlying issues behind actually that, that time that is spent actually excessively on doing a certain task. And you understand also the architecture enough to be able to uh, push certain optimizations forward. You have to understand which of these 
uh, bottlenecks that you have now managed to list need uh, more time uh, when it comes to um, doing the performance analysis, uh, performance actually optimization. Uh, so the point here is you have, for example, a code where you have a first uh, hotspot that takes 40% of the total execution time. But if we optimize it, we will only manage to gain 10% on the 40% execution time, but 4% total speed up on the whole application runtime. So the idea here is to compare this, this case with the second case where you have a, a hotspot that takes a much smaller footprint, so only 20% of total execution time, but has a better potential for, uh, for, uh, for speed up if we do optimization. So we gain 10% overall and 50% uh, regarding the 20% of total execution time. So the idea here is to focus on what will give you the most um, performance first and then go by elimination and remove each and every one of those bottlenecks from the most rewarding to the the, the least rewarding and maybe the least rewarding does not even need to be optimized because uh, it's so small sometimes uh, it doesn't really require any effort so here you can see actually a motivating example coming from a uh, real code so this is a real application that does uh, uh, i think uh, molecular dynamics and you can see here that there are many issues that uh, we can clearly see just by looking at the source code. So this is Fortran, uh, and it's a do loop that goes for a certain number of iterations that is unknown. So by looking at the code, we can clearly see that here we're using a variable. So obviously, this is going to be defined at runtime. So there's no way we can know uh, the value of this variable before the execution of this loop. And we'll see later on that this could be an obstacle for loop optimizations. Compilers can do a much better job when they know uh, how many iterations a loop can do in advance. Uh, we can look here, actually, we can see uh, memory loads. So we are loading uh, information from memory into uh, uh, into here uh, from diff three different spots. So you can see here that we use an NJ1, NJ2, and NJ3 indices. And they're all calculated, actually, uh, above. So this is um, non-unit stridden accesses, which means that we're not accessing memory in a regular fashion. We're doing some uh, computation that is not predictable. Uh, here we're using a square root and a division. So these are known to be uh, algorithmically challenging for architects. Uh, designing a square root or a division circuit uh, within CPU is pretty complex. So uh, these actually are high latency instructions. And we'll see later, actually, that we can uh, detect them and even find sometimes uh, a way out of using actually these uh, heavy instructions. Uh, we can see here again that we have an un undirect access, which means that we're first loading the index from memory before we do uh, another memory access based on that index. And this is quite uh, heavy because you need to do two memory accesses in order to get access to the data. And memory accesses are sometimes quite problematic. You have to make sure that um, data comes from the cache, so there are some some analyses that we can do at binary level to provide information about whether uh, an indirect access can be changed or not at some point. So we'll see this actually in the next slides uh, with with, uh, with some of the Macau tools. So here we have also uh, reductions, so we're doing a lot of additions. So these are just arithmetic operations. And uh, again, non-unit stridden accesses um, using the same indices that were calculated actually above. So these are the six major issues that we can visually um, detect by uh, on this code just by looking uh, at the code patterns and the, the operations that are being performed here. So this case, actually, we'll look at it in detail. And we'll show, actually, what Macau can do on, uh, on the binary version of this, of this, uh, this snippet of code. So what is Macau actually in reality? Uh, Macau is a, a binary analysis tool that we later on use actually as a, as a, as a layer to perform uh, HPC or performance related analyses. Uh, so we'll see later in the, in, the, in, in, a, in the next slide actually the detailed structure of the tool and how we can do actually, uh, how we move from one layer to another from the high level um, user-friendly structures to the low-level, actually, binary analysis uh, uh, data structures. So the main objectives of Macau are to uh, first 
characterize the performance of HPC applications. So we're mainly centered uh, around HPC applications. We focus in on the performance at the core level because the idea is that if you have good performance at a uh, single core level, well, then moving to parallelism usually implies just duplicating the same process over different compute units. So um, go in for vectorization, go in for better cache usage at core level, and then duplicating that pattern all around in general actually yields um, much higher performance than, than uh, a main focus on only parallelism. So the idea here is to see uh, how does a code behave uh, on a certain architecture and try to make, make it fit the best possible that architect to, the, to that architecture in order to obtain the best performance. Uh, the third point is to be able to guide users actually through the optimization process. So provide information that uh, will allow programmers or uh, the engineer or the uh, scientist doing the performance analysis to have a much uh, better understanding of what's going on and be able to drive the compiler or maybe change the source code in a way that can yield better performance. And also, uh, last point is to evaluate the return on investment uh, that a, a um, person or an engineer doing, the, um, optim doing optimization on a certain application actually can gain from those optimizations. Uh, and the idea here is to provide all of this in advance so that you can make uh, much informed decisions in the future regarding the performance optimization process of a certain application. So the main characteristics of Macao are the fact that it's a modular tool, so we can build modules around the core. So I said, actually, it's a binary analysis tool. And around that binary analysis layer, we can build different modules that do uh, exactly what we designed them to do. Uh, and it would be, uh, in this case, um, analysis on um, the assembly code to be able to detect actually some patterns and detect actually some some issues uh, and then report them back up to the to the user and format all this in, in a user friendly actually uh, output. So that's the idea behind actually the complementary views is to bring the low level information right up to a high level uh, user friendly uh, and user understandable actually format. Uh, it works on Intel x86 and uh, Xeon Phi, so uh, Intel and AMD, so x86 architecture in general. And we're also doing actually some work now on, uh, on ARM. We've done some work in the past, but we've just booted up uh, the old ARM version again because it's it's starting to, to uh, ARM is starting to get into the HPC world and we're, we're going to most likely start seeing some HPC nodes come up in the future. Um, it's LGPL3 and open source. You can go to the Macau website and download either the binary version or the source code version. Uh, the source code version does not contain all the modules um, because we keep them actually internally, but uh, the core of Macau is, is available and you can develop your own modules. We have tutorials on how to do that and also tutorials on how to do exactly what I'm going to show you today. Uh, it's been developed at the University of Versailles since 2004 and we do around two to three binary releases a year sometimes more depending on, on, the, on the period actually and uh, whether we did some major bug fixing or not. So um, everything is available actually on the Macau website and uh, I would encourage you actually to go take a, take a look. Uh, so not only do we develop Macau, but we also um, at the University of Versailles, the, the lab that we work at, we also do performance analysis ourselves with um, partners that have uh, different range of um, HPC applications. So these are some success stories of the speed ups that we have obtained actually doing certain specific optimizations that Macau have managed to help us find. Um, um, QMC Chem, for example, a quantum chemistry code, which we managed to speed up uh, three times by doing, uh, by removing actually some function invocations from that had identical parameters from, from loop bodies. So just removing the function calls from loop bodies was a major actually step forward in performance. There's another application doing a computational fluid dynamics called ELS2 that we also managed to speed up to 2.8 times faster uh, by removing actually the double structure and directions. So this is what I pointed out earlier before in the motivating example. Um, if you manage to remove the double structure and directions, you will gain uh, immense performance because that will uh, enlighten actually the, the heavy load that was uh, that was put on memory. 
Uh, and then we also have two other codes, uh, Polaris and AVBP, one that does uh, molecular dynamics, from which you saw the code snippet earlier in the motivating example. So in this case, we had a 50% to 70% performance increase just by uh, uh, forcing actually loop vectorization. So that required actually to guide the compiler um, for certain specific loops uh, into understanding uh, what was going on so that the compiler could do its job properly and vectorize the, those loops. So 50 to 70% speed up is not, a, is not a bad speed up in general. Um, we also had actually a decent speed ups for, uh, for another CFD code, AVBP, that required actually some um, change of code patterns, for example, changing divisions by uh, uh, reciprocal multiplications. So these are small tricks that when they are possible, because this could be actually a huge issue when it comes to um, uh, correctness and also um, floating point computations do not always uh, play fair with, with these kind of optimizations. So sometimes it's not really possible to do, um, to change an operation by another that is less costly. But in this case, actually, um, it was possible to play around with the code and, and push uh, the performance right up to a 17% uh, increase. And uh, there was some full unrolling of certain loops also, uh, which m meant that you remove the loop and you just keep the, the, um, the body actually duplicated because you have a very low number of iterations. And uh, the loop control costs actually much more than the, the uh, uh, the code actually that's being performed in the, in the loop body. Um, we have a certain number of partnerships and people that we worked with and uh, some other ent entities, including Intel and the equivalent of the uh, Department of Energy here in France. It's the CEA. Um, we've been actually funded uh, through multiple grants working on different projects. We also had collaborations with the um, with the, the team uh, of Tao, with Samir Shende and, uh, and uh, his whole team actually here in France and in the US. Uh, collaboration with a, a French company working on a, a profiler. They were using actually the uh, Madras, which is the disassembler and reassembler uh, that we use in Macau uh, to do their own actually uh, analysis, to do their own actually disassembly for doing their own analysis. And they also used actually the uh, MIL, which is the Macau instrumentation language. Uh, sort of like Lua um, layer that allows programmers uh, to easily actually insert probes within a, within a code. Uh, we also collaborated with the Intel advisor team uh, in the US and in Russia and uh, um, another research lab actually that we're still collaborating with right now uh, at, um, at, at Bordeaux at um, Ninaya. Uh, there's also a company that was started by a, a previous uh, Macau team member that works on mainly uh, doing training and uh, helping people actually use Macau and understand the performance analysis process using Macau. Uh, you can check the website actually at uh, pxl.eu. Um, well, here you can see a list of the team members and collaborators. Um, so many PhDs and engineers and, uh, and uh, interns that worked on some aspects at some point of Macau or uh, that uh, brought about actually a, um, a new tool or worked mainly on, on, on developing actually a, a methodology at some point like for, um, for uh, sampling and for also static analysis. So these are all the people that are collaborated with us in the past and uh, some of our current collaborators uh, still. So now we'll dig into the uh, binary analysis layer. So we'll see, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what Macau does at the low level and uh, we'll see actually what kind of issues we face when we go down actually to the binary level to perform an analysis. So the idea here is to um, analyze what you run. So from the ground up, we do not want to go and analyze the source code because once it goes through the compiler, it turns into something totally different. So our point here is to go down to the binary level because that's where you find the code patterns expressed in the smallest possible units, so the instructions that we can actually analyze and understand and maybe uh, profile in a certain way, statically or dynamically, to be able to provide information to the users. And that's because compiler optimizations actually will totally actually change the form of, uh, of, of the code. So the logic at the source code does not necessarily reflect uh, easily actually at the lowest level. And that's why we go there actually and analyze the, the, the binary because that's what you're going to be running. And because source code instrumentation uh, can hinder actually the compiler 
at some point because you add in code to analyze code and obviously that's uh, gonna be uh, analyzed and um, seen by the compiler so eventually this is gonna cause some issue um, the idea here is to be able to do binary instrumentation so after the compiler is done if it is possible for us to go and perform surgery on the binary file so open up um, maybe a section and insert probes insert function calls and um, variables and so on uh, then we can start doing things actually uh, in a much surgical and cleaner way. And that's the idea here, actually, is to be able to um, uh, play around with the instructions so that we can have a much lower level of granularity that allows us to be detailed, actually, in our analysis. So the main steps, once you uh, take a binary file and you uh, ask Macau to analyze it, um, the first thing that will happen is we will build a certain number of high-level data structures, like a control flow graph, um, data dependency graph, uh, static sync and assignment, and so on. And these structures, they will later on be used um, using the high-level scripts, so what we call modules, to perform the analyses that we want to actually perform. So uh, we'll see actually how CQA later on uses actually the data dependency graph to be able to figure out uh, the uh, different interactions between the instructions and how do they actually fit together within a loop body, for example, or within a um, uh, basic block of the control flow graph. So the other point that we try to uh, emphasize here is that once we do the binary analysis, um, it has to be correlated to the source code because otherwise the programmer will not know how to change the source code or where to change the source code to obtain actually a much better assembly code. So the point here is to use the debug information that is provided by the, the, the compiler at compile time to be able to correlate between the low level structures and the high level structures in your code. So suppose you have a function with a bunch of uh, loops within it. And one of those loops is a high, uh, hot, hot spot actually in your application. So the idea here is to be able to detect the hot, hot spot by doing um, uh, dynamic analysis and, and, and sampling, then analyze that hotspot statically. So analyze the assembly code, but then also be able to say that, okay, this is the uh, loop that is at the line number uh, X at the file uh, that contains it. So that information is only available actually at compile time, uh, at, at, by the com is only available if the compiler actually inserts it at, the com at compile time. So you have to make sure that you use the dash G uh, flag when you compile in your application if you want Macau to do the correlation for you. Otherwise, I mean, the binary is going to run fine. You're just not going to have as much detail as you would like to have if you do not insert actually uh, uh, debug information within the binary. And you can see here actually this small diagram here that shows um, the difficulty that we have with that correlation. So you have one loop at the source level, line 255, and uh, located at file let's see. Now, after optimizations, the compiler split that loop into different versions. So you have a first version loop one and a second version loop two, and then you have a, a vectorized, for example, version with a peel and tail, and then a main vector loop here that does, for example, um, the, the operations that are expressed here at source code, but in a vector manner. So the point here is for us, when we do the analysis at low level, I mean, we're gonna see all these loops and we have to correlate them all back to the same source code or source line and source file. And this is pretty tedious and difficult. And the only way to do it properly is by uh, requesting from the compiler to insert debug information. Uh, here you can see the main structure of Macau. Okay, so on the left, you have the low level side, and then you have the API that allows us to move from that low level C and, 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 and uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, C structures to uh, much higher uh, level Lua structures that we can manipulate actually with the, with the Lua script. So we chose Lua just because it's a language that interfaces very well with C and uh, we can actually modify the language. It is open source also. We can, we can modify the interpreter and play around actually with the language if we ever need to. So here you can see that the application is being fed to Macau. First thing we do is disassemble uh, the application. So uh, Madras is going to read the, um, uh, the ELF binary file and then read the sections and go on and find the uh, different uh, sections within the file and the different subsections within the file. And then once that is done, the disassembly will create actually a, um, 
data structure with all the instructions and information about the instructions that can be used later to perform uh, an analysis that will generate the internal representations that I talked about earlier. So the control flow graph, the data dependency graph, the SSA. So these will be actually uh, created after the analysis that comes after the disassembly. And once we have the internal representations through the Lua API, we can start accessing the information within those uh, uh, data structures and uh, using it actually at a much higher level here using Lua as a, as a programming language. Uh, and then the other layer that we have here is the layer of patching, which allows us to do binary rewriting. So this is the strength of Macau is we can take a binary file, uh, as I said, perform surgery on it, insert function calls, remove instructions, add instructions, do all sorts of um, operations on the binary file and then generate a new functioning executable program. So let's just say, for example, that you want to time the execution of a certain loop. So Macau can help you insert a timing probe before and after the loop. Um, so you can actually uh, obtain after that the total runtime of that loop in particular. So by the way, we have a tool that does that. Uh, and 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 in general, actually, uh, uh, most people do that at source level by using RDTSC or using a clock get time uh, within, within the source code, uh, which is not going to cause some issues at compile time, but it might cause actually um, uh, some some issues maybe uh, if you have a lot of functions that you want to profile at some point and that you don't want the compiler actually to see the performance uh, measurement uh, probes. So in this case, we can also access the, the patch layer or the patching layer uh, through Lua. So it's pretty simple to write actually a, a script that does instrumentation of a binary. Uh, you can target functions, loops, uh, any I would say um, code construct that Macau can can provide uh, that go right up to basic blocks if you, if you need to go down to to the basic block level. So here you can see that we already have uh, a bunch of modules ready, uh, LProf, CQA, and uh, we have a, a certain number of other modules. And here LProf is the sampling profiler. So what it will do is um, watch your application while it is running. And it will actually watch it um, at a certain interval of time. So it will wake up like every uh, thousand milliseconds and then, or, or every hundred milliseconds, sorry, and then uh, collect information about where the application is at that moment. So by collecting all those samples, we can later on actually build an idea of, of the performance profile of the application. So where is the application spend in time? Where are the functions uh, that are running the most, the loops that are running the most and so on. And we can actually sort all these up and uh, uh, allow the user to see which are the hotspots that need to be taken care of earlier, actually, uh, if the user decides to go for, a, for, for optimization later. Then on those hotspots that LProf is going to list for us, we'll run actually a, um, a static analyzer called uh, Code Quality Analyzer CQA. And what it will do is actually it will do um, um, a static analysis using machine model. So we have a model of the CPU pipeline and a model of um, CPU actually boxes, and we will see how your code fits within that model and what kind of performance do we get out of modeling the execution of that, that piece of code that you are analyzing. And in this case, we will do actually the analysis on the major hotspots that LProf has returned. Um, and after that, you can actually uh, uh, run one view, and one view is the master orchestrator of all the uh, other modules. So. LProf and CQA are separate modules that you can run separately and you know you can by yourself uh, understand actually the reports and read the reports and see what needs to be done. But you can also invoke one view uh, which will build a nice HTML report for you and it will do the, um, I would say, launching and analysis automatically by using LProf and CQA. So one view is, as we like to call it in the team, it's like a master orchestrator of all the other tools. And what it does, it, it reads a configuration file, and then it does what the configuration file tells it to do. Uh, and it's pretty complex because it also can uh, manage to run an application on a cluster using a configuration file. We can define how to run an application on a cluster using actually, uh, for example, a Slurm or any, uh, any batch manager that we handle. And then from there on, actually, you can run your application, collect all the performance data, and then build a nice HTML report that uh, we'll see actually later on and we'll navigate at some point. So this is in general actually the decision uh, tree that we uh, follow. So as I said, first we do profiling with the sampling engine. 
then we uh, isolate the loops of interest, so the hotspots, the main loops that will uh, take most of the execution time of the application. And then we run uh, different types of analyses. Uh, the first one will be CPU oriented and the second one memory oriented. So going back to the first slide where I was talking about the uh, memory boundedness of an application or the compute boundedness of an application. So this is where we decide on how we decide using the Macau tools on the different Macau modules. Uh, for CPU oriented, obviously we use CQA because it uses a machine model uh, to evaluate the, uh, the performance of a snippet of code. Uh, we also have a module that does differential analysis. So this requires us to remove instructions and generate multiple versions of the same uh, loop, for example, or function. And what will happen here is, for example, you can take uh, a code that does um, memory loads plus um, arithmetic operations. And in this case, we will remove the memory loads, for example, and we will uh, generate a new binary file with a modified version of the loop and compare the different uh, the performance of different loops. So the one that is fully um, complete, so the code generated by the compiler, and then the code modified by Macau where the uh, load store operations have been either removed or replaced. And we can then evaluate the impact of the arithmetic operations. So this is pro proceeding by elimination. So we remove something and we see how much it costs to run the application without it. And we can do that actually, obviously, in the uh, other way by removing the arithmetic operations and seeing how much it costs us to run only load store operations. So this is pretty tricky, and uh, it's uh, it's actually done both for uh, CPU oriented and memory oriented. It's just that in each and every one of those cases, we will target a different set of uh, of instructions. Uh, we also have value profiling, which does what I talked about earlier. Uh, we have a tool called vprof that will um, inject at the binary level uh, a set of probes that will allow you to uh, evaluate the runtime of the application in cycles, for example. So what it will simply do is take a loop and then insert uh, RDTSC probes or before the loop and after the loop, and then once the loop is done, we'll do the delta between the results and then provide you with the, the cycles uh, that were elapsed during the execution of the, of the loop. Uh, for memory behavior characterization, we also have actually a, uh, a bunch of analyses uh, performed by CQA uh, and also by differential analysis, as I said, by removing instructions and also changing instructions. Like uh, we can also change the target. Like if you have load and store operations and they go into a certain address, we can remove that address and make sure that they access data from L1. So we can see how does a loop react when all the memory loads and stores hit the L1 cache instead of memory and so on. So these are kind of like tricky little uh, modifications that we will do on the binary so we can have a better grasp of where does the program spend most of its time and where are uh, at the instruction level uh, the instructions that have uh, performance issues or high latency, for example. Uh, here a little word about SIMD because this is a very important subject and it involves actually three main points. So data parallelism, memory, and compiler optimizations. Uh, I mean, this is pretty basic computer architecture. Uh, most CPUs have scalar operations available uh, or operators or instructions available. So a scalar operation operates on single data. So you take a, a value A and a value B and you can do an operation in them. Here you can see the example is an addition. But there is also another class of operations or another class of architectures that um, involves doing operations on a pack of data or a vector of data or uh, um, a set of data. So in this case, um, in this example, I can show the difference between the um, single uh, scalar adder and then a vector adder that uses four uh, lanes within each vector and performs actually a, a vector addition. So the idea here is to understand that um, you're not going to get any lower latency because doing one addition is exactly the, will cost you the same as doing four parallel additions in this case. So if this addition costs one cycle, all these four in parallel will also cost you one cycle because you're doing them in parallel. But the gain here is in doing more work in the same amount of time as earlier. So we increase the bandwidth or the instructions per cycle or the bytes per cycle in this case. So we're doing actually four additions uh, for the price of one in a certain way. You can look at it that way. So this could be very advantageous in certain cases when the patterns actually play very well with vectorization. This uh, can improve the performance by um, orders of magnitude and it's 
pretty difficult sometimes to push the compiler to do the, the right job uh, when the pattern is, is, is difficult to vectorize actually uh, already by hand at source level. So there are some cases where this is possible and in cases where this is not possible, but in general, we always try to find the best way uh, to express the code so that the compiler can do the vectorization. And in, if it fails, well, then we can maybe vectorize by hand using intrinsics or maybe write an assembly code by hand, which is not something that we recommend because this will make your um, um, maintenance, code maintenance actually quite hellish in the future. Um, so in general here, you can see scalar patterns like we can see in C. So this is typical C or C++ uh, uh, expression where you can go and do an operation per element. And then you can see here um, an equivalent but vectorized expression that you can do in Fortran. Fortran actually has array sections. So you can specify a chunk of an array, a vector within an array, and you can actually easily express uh, SIMD patterns uh, with Fortran than with C. And this is uh, one of the major points, actually, why Fortran is still used by a lot of uh, people in the scientific community, because, um, well, one, they can still express their formulas in a, in a much easier way than in C. And then the other point is you can easily express, actually, vector operations that will yield, actually, much better performance at compile time than if you actually uh, try to do it in C by hand. And not only that, but there's also some memory issues that we'll talk about in the next point. So as I said, the benefits, uh, benefits here are increase in memory bandwidth and instructions per cycle. And uh, some example of uh, um, implementations of SIMD instruction sets or vector instruction sets are uh, on the ARM side, we have NEON, um, which deals with vectors of 128 bits. So it does 16 bytes, uh, which means that you can do two double precision operations, uh, two double precision uh, operations on two double precision elements, sorry. Uh, and or you can use SVE, which is a new uh, instruction set that has not yet been implemented uh, publicly, but that is implemented actually on the Fugaku uh, A64FX uh, ARM CPU. Uh, and this instruction set actually uses a um, variable vector length. So you can specify different um, vector lengths at execution time, uh, but the code is, is actually expressed in a vector manner that allows it to run um, with different vector lengths depending on the architecture. And this is pretty interesting and it's apparently uh, um, very expected actually uh, because a lot of people want to see actually the kind of performance we can obtain with uh, SVE-like instruction sets. Uh, on the Intel and AMD side, we have the uh, SAC instruction set and AVX. Uh, and then on the Intel side exclusively, we have the AVX 512 which is nothing but just a, a, a vector enlargement from one generation to the other, plus a certain number of instructions that were added to ease certain uh, operations and lower the latency of certain operations like gathers and scatters and uh, square roots and uh, fused multiply adds and so on. So next point is memory. And the major point regarding memory is that if you are doing uh, C or C++ programming, uh, you have to be careful uh, when it comes to memory alignment, okay? Uh, first thing, you, I mean, that you have to keep in mind is what we said earlier uh, is that computations are, in general, faster than memory. So you always want your code to be doing more compute than spending time actually reading and writing to memory. Um, next and most important point here is the alignment of, of, of your memory according to the cache line size that you have on, a, on, the, on, on the machine that you're running your code on. And what memory alignment actually is, is pretty simple. You can look here on the right. There are two examples of what aligned memory access looks like. So you have the cache line boundaries here. And these boundaries actually can be sometimes crossed if the memory is not aligned. And that will require a double load. So you need to load from the first cache line and from the second cache line. And then combine the two halves together and then load it up to, to the caches or to the, uh, to the CPU. And this is quite problematic sometimes. Um, Modern architectures actually don't spend much time actually uh, on this anymore, but you can still have cases uh, where this can happen and cause a lot of issues when it comes to, uh, to performance. Because if you do not ensure that your memory is aligned, vectorization might cause actually uh, segmentation faults. So you have to be careful when you want your code to be vectorized to make sure that your memory is aligned and that the compiler knows about the intent 
uh, that you have to align your memory so that it can easily actually make better choices when it comes to vectorization. Uh, so you can do memory alignment by using uh, POSIX memaline. So instead of using a normal malloc, uh, you can also use an aligned alloc. These are kind of like the same. They just have different uh, prototypes. They take different parameters or parameters in a different order, but they do the same job as they make sure that they provide you with a, uh, a memory chunk that is actually uh, aligned to a certain boundary that you have specified earlier. And in general, I would recommend if you're using, for example, SSC to align on 16 bytes with AVX on 32 bytes and on AVX 512 with 64 bytes. Why? Because that is the uh, largeness or the width of the vector uh, that is used for each and every one of these instruction sets. So these one are 16 bytes, 32 bytes, and this one is 64 bytes, which is a, a full cache line on Intel architectures. And also make sure that the data comes from the caches, okay? If you can do blocking, if you can uh, ensure with prefetchers that the data is in the cache at the moment it will be requested, you will most likely increase the performance of your application by lowering the impact of going down to memory every time. And uh, each and every one of these caches is difficult to handle because they're all different. They do not exist for the same reasons. They do not have the same sizes and sometimes they don't even have um, uh, inclusiveness between. So we don't know actually whether the lower level cache includes what the higher level cache uh, contains and so on. So you have to read the documentation and make sure that when you optimize for cache to um, be informed actually properly and to test your different implementations and measure the performance properly. Um, next, last point here is the compiler optimization. So um, you have to treat the compiler as your best friend and also as your worst friend. Because if you provide the compiler with the best information possible and the most valuable information possible regarding a certain code construct, it will do the best code generation possible for you. But if you do not care and you just throw in a bunch of flags to the compiler without you know, uh, verifying whether it is doing what it's supposed to be doing or making sure that that is what the compiler is supposed to get in order for you to obtain the, the, the kind of code pattern you want, uh, after code generation or the kind of performance you expect, uh, you have to make sure that you read the documentation and that you um, use the proper tools for, I mean, the proper flags for the proper uh, for the proper loop body or function body or for the proper optimization. And you have also to make sure at some point that you gain performance after asking for those optimizations because sometimes it happens that performance is degraded after certain optimizations for some reason. It might be related to the architecture or maybe to the to the excessiveness of a certain optimization, but you have to make sure at some point that the compiler does not uh, stab you in the back by maybe not doing the optimizations that, that you request or maybe doing them actually and not obtaining the performance that you expect. And one of the major points is um, always try to specify the target architecture. Um, if you can do that uh, in your compilation process in a dynamic way, that would be the best way possible. But if you can't just do it Hard coded actually in the in the in the make files, uh, just so so you can see the difference between when you ask the compiler for specific optimizations targeting a specific architecture versus when you um, uh, kind of like just let the compiler do code generation without knowing much about the target architecture. So I mean, major optimizations will be here: uh, um, loop and rolling, uh, vectorization, uh, maybe loop splitting, and so on. And loop and rolling is quite a, a major optimization because it will allow you to reduce the number of branches. So if you have a loop that does like 100 iterations, if you unroll by four, you'll only do 25 iterations. So loop control takes much less uh, space within the loop execution. And you'll spend more time doing the compute that the loop is supposed to be doing. It also fills the pipeline with uh, a lot of instructions. So it keeps the CPU busy. And that's something that the CPU wants to uh, to be. It's always actually tries to go as fast as possible uh, and you have to allow it to uh, go as fast as possible by making sure that it has the right amount of work and it, it also increases memory bandwidth because if you have a lot of um, memory loads within a loop and then you enroll it well then you start pumping more memory and that will most likely actually trigger a bunch of circuitry you have within the cpu that will push uh, for maybe caching a little bit more or maybe uh, accessing data in in a prefetched manner. So this is actually a, an overview of the output of uh, LPROF. 
So as I said earlier, LProf is the lightweight profiler that does um, sampling-based profiling. So it will um, run in the background while your program is running, and it will wake up every a certain number of, uh, of, uh, of, na of milliseconds and collect samples about the program. So where is the program running? For, for example, we'll collect the instruction pointer. Um, we'll collect actually a certain number of uh, hardware counters and parameters on the system. And then we'll combine all those together at the end of the execution to build the profile that you can see on the right. So you can see the list of functions here, and each of one of each one of those functions has a set of loops, and some of those loops have innermost loops and so on. So you can see here the whole hierarchy and uh, the sorted list of uh, hotspots. You can see that the first loop uh, takes 23.19% uh, total time, so it covers actually. 23.19% uh, of the total execution time, and all the other uh, loops here. And you have the equivalent time here in seconds. You also have the number of threads. Uh, you can add actually some, some, some more information here. We'll see actually on a, on a real report what it looks like. Um, so as I said, we can collect hardware counters. So you can specify a, a list of hardware counters, whether it is on Intel or on AMD. Uh, and then it will uh, collect all that information and provide the uh, the report that you can see here at function and loop granularity. So there's another tab. We'll, we'll see this in detail when we switch to the uh, to the um, uh, to the actually uh, Macau report, and we'll see actually the difference between both views, what you can see actually in functions and what you can see uh, at a loop view. Um, so the strength of LProf is it's non-intrusiveness, so it's capable of running in the background without being that intrusive. It doesn't require modifying the binary or inserting any probes or anything. We just run in the background. And we use actually the perf event open system call to be able to uh, uh, attach to a process and then collect all sorts of information from the, the system layer. Uh, it's low overhead, so it will add a very low overhead actually to, to the, the runtime of your application. The analysis will take a little bit more time because that is going through a lot of data, but the runtime itself is not going to be uh, affected that much by, uh, by the profiling from LPROF. And the, the major point or the major strength here is that it is agnostic. So similar to perf that you might have encountered on a Linux system, um, LPROF is actually agnostic of parallel runtime. So you can run it on an MPI run application or an open MP application or a pthread application, any kind of parallelism actually, uh, runtime um, par parallelism, uh, I would say um, runtime implementation actually is, is handled in this case because we run at the system level. We don't depend actually on the on the on the libraries used for for the parallelism. Uh, CQA is the code quality analyzer, as I said before. Um, it is meant to assist the developers through static analysis of the assembly code. So we'll provide you with a report similar to what you see on the right here, with um, uh, information about what's happening within that that code uh, in particular or a loop or a function uh, that you're targeting. So it doesn't require any code execution. It just opens the binary file and goes and analyzes uh, the assembly code of a loop. Uh, we can do cross analysis, meaning that I can analyze a AMD binary on an Intel machine or a different Intel architecture uh, on a, for example, a Sandy Bridge laptop. You can go in and analyze a Haswell binary and so on. So the advantage of being static a uh, statically based tool is that you can just uh, you know specify the architecture and the command line and the analysis will be uh, done according to the specified architecture. Um, it does uh, an assessment and an evaluation of the quality uh, of the compiler generated code. So that's the main point here. This is why we actually we call it code quality analyzer. And then the major um, point here or the major contribution of LProf is that it is capable of um, uh, taken all these information that we have extracted from the binary analysis or from the assembly analysis in this case and providing hints and workarounds to the developer. So we can tell you, oh, you didn't use uh, this compiler flag. Maybe you should try it. Oh, you have an issue here with these instructions. Maybe you should try this code construct instead. So you will have actually uh, propositions of changes and things you can do at the source code level or at the compiler level to make your code has or push the compiler to generate a code with much better quality. And then you can, after doing actually those um, those modifications, you can run the binary again into uh, into uh, within Macau, and then L uh, CQA, in this case, will provide you with a, an evaluation of 
whether this code has increased in quality or not. So you can see here on the right that we evaluate the cycles uh, statically here. So there's a 14% speed up expected from this loop if uh, instructions, scalar instructions are you know, uh, removed and most likely vectorized. So you can see here that um, we have a workaround that proposes to reorganize an array, uh, maybe doing loop permutation. Uh, also here for vectorization, you have uh, CQA telling you that the loop is not vectorized, meaning that eight data elements could be processed, but you only do in actually scalar operations. This means that we can increase or speed up the uh, execution time by eight if we manage to vectorize the whole loop. So these are predictive, but they're still actually uh, uh, very optimistic. So you might not get an 8x speed up, but maybe a 5x or a 6x speed up would be would be already a, a good thing in this case if you vectorize properly, because you might have some other issues related to memory and so on all around. But in general, uh, you can have an 8x speed up if you have a simple enough code that you can apply actually uh, vectorization on. So CQA will give you the information available uh, uh, at, in the documentation uh, of the compiler, but it will also give you actually workarounds and hints for um, pushing the compiler or guiding the compiler to be more precise into generating much better quality code. Uh, CQA is loop-centric, so HPC, uh, most hotspots in HPC are going to be actually loops because that's where repetition happens. So we are mostly focus on loop analysis and we target compute bounds, though you can have actually some memory related uh, hints here in the in, in the report, but it's mainly actually targeted towards compute bound code. So you'll have a much better insight if your code is uh, doing actually, uh, is doing a lot of computations. It will be able to give you a lot of uh, information about what's happening within the, the machine model. So the main concepts of CQA are, you know, peak performance, execution pipeline, and uh, how the resources or functional units are being used. Um, so the idea here is to see, as I said before, the impact of changing, for example, a, a scalar code to uh, vector code and increasing actually the, the, the data processing by pushing the uh, bandwidth further. And also being able to uh, detect actually the high latency uh, instructions. So CQA, if there is a square root that is found in your code or a division, uh, CQA will point that out and will also provide a workaround if that is necessary. And as I said earlier, the point is to guide the compiler optimization process uh, and to give the user enough information so that the compiler can do a better job. And it will also give you, CQA will give you information about how you can reorganize your memory sometimes. Uh, if you do an indirect accesses, they will be detected and then CQA will tell you maybe you should use uh, a different code pattern in this case or try a, try a, uh, different compiler optimization that will maybe yield a code that is more suited for your 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 case so and here you can see the different hints that the cqa tool will provide uh, so flags pragmas keywords that you can either add at the compilation line or uh, within the source code uh, to make sure that you're using the full architecture capabilities as we pointed out earlier using the best uh, using the features available the best way possible. Uh, sometimes we have to force certain things because the compiler can be uh, extremely restrictive or uh, conservative. So the point here is to sometimes force it to do the job that it doesn't want to do for some reason, but that we know is safe to be done. Uh, also, as I said, try to bypass the conservative behavior. So earlier I gave the example of uh, the precision with this kind of optimization. So when you switch a division by a reciprocal multiplication. So this is okay sometimes when it's possible and it will definitely yield a great performance, but uh, it will affect the precision of your computation. So you have to be careful that when you bypass these conservative behaviors, you don't break the semantics and you don't break the precision of your application. So of course the major hints here are memory alignment that you should keep in mind, um, majorly related to data access. So memory alignment, loop interchange, so you can access data in the correct order. Um, the matrix multiply in C and in Fortran is the base, basic example where you can see that when you switch uh, the most inner, most loops, actually you'll get a much better performance because you'll access data in a much linear fashion. Uh, change in loop strides sometimes. 
uh, if it is possible, this will ha most likely happen if you do enrolling. And the reshaping arrays and structures, because um, most of the time we go in with a, a certain idea about how data should be structured, but they do not match the best way possible that the architecture can do for you. Uh, so you should be careful about how you organize your data and always keep in mind that you're going to run on a certain architecture that handles your data in a certain way so that you can remain within the, the sweet spot of the best memory access possible and uh, the best organization possible for that uh, data structure within a certain architecture. And also, if you can avoid high latency instructions, that would be the best thing possible. But uh, eventually, if they're necessary, make sure that you, um, you use the best version available and that you time your code and prof uh, profile your code so you know whether there are uh, major bottlenecks or not. Sometimes they can be there and not be bottlenecks, but sometimes they can uh, actually influence the performance in a, in a great manner. So this is the motivating example that we saw earlier. So these are the major points that uh, impact the performance of this code. And here you can see what CQA managed to detect. So managed to detect everything at binary level. So everything that we can see here in the source code, we managed to you know, um, report it back up to the user. And you can see here that um, uh, non-unit strides have been detected here. And there isn't much we can say except provide maybe here a sort of like workaround to change things uh, at source level. Uh, divisions and square roots, also they have been detected. Um, the different vector versus scalar uh, operations. So here, obviously, there's a mix of, of, um, of vector and scalar operations, which is quite bad when it comes to performance. Um, we can see here the indirect accesses also have been detected. We have, in fact, here one indirect access. And it has been detected here. And uh, the high number of statements related to the number of fused multiply add operations. So you can see here we have a lot of add and multiplies. Um, so obviously there were 48 fused multiply add operations and add operations actually detected, which means that there's a lot going on within that loop. And maybe uh, the programmer should give a little bit more attention to what's going on in there. But the idea here is to show that all those issues that we managed to pick up visually actually from the source code, we've also managed to pick them up actually using a, a automated um, static analysis tool because they have reflected actually at the binary level, at the assembly level in some way. Um, so one view is, as I said, the uh, master orchestrator of all the uh, modules that we use, mainly LPROF and CQA. And it builds a nice HTML report uh, that will help you uh, understand much better what's going on within your application. So it's fully automated uh, performance analysis with a uh, one-click or let's just say one command line actually uh, uh, between you and your performance analysis report. So what LPROF does is in general actually run, uh, I mean, uh, one view does is run actually LPROF and CQA. So LPROF will give us the list of hotspots. So this is something that I talked about earlier. And then CQA will run on those hotspots. So we'll do static analysis on each and every one of those hotspots. And hotspots in this case are going to be loops mainly. And then once we're done with the CQA analysis, we'll correlate all of this to the source code. And we will build actually the uh, aggregated performance views that you will see later on. I'll show you actually a real report and how to generate a report yourselves. Um, and then there you'll have some additional information that you will you cannot have actually from either tool, but you can have from a tool that runs them both together and has a much higher view of the, the application. So using actually the um, hotspot list and the CQ analysis, we can therefore do speed up predictions, uh, do a global code quality uh, analysis of the whole application because we have actually a um, single block in this case, uh, code quality metrics. So we can now do a much larger uh, an evaluation of the quality of the of the code. And we can also provide uh, hints for improving the overall application performance, not just small loops, but the whole application per performance. And it might be actually at, um, at different points. So as I said earlier, uh, we might give you hints for source code or compiler flags and, and maybe for system sometimes, system tuning. Um, we also have a mode that runs parallel efficiency analysis. So this is a mode that we call scalability. You can run an application in different parallel configurations. 
So you can, for example, do a, a run with two threads, four th threads, eight threads, and so on, and then see how does the scalability or the performance actually move with the scalability uh, that you're trying to test, actually, or the scalability model that you're trying to test. So this is um, um, a tool for automation of, of actually performance profiling and performance experiments. Um, well, here you have an example of how you can run the tool. So all you have to do is download Macau from the website. And then here you have an example of how to run it on a BTMZ. So that's what I'll be showing you. But then I'll show you actually a much interesting report than the one on BT, because this is a pretty simple application. It's not really that complicated. And uh, you can run it, in this case, using MPI. So this is the MPI version of the NAS parallel benchmarks. And you can run it like this. So you can provide, actually, one view with the command line that will be used to run this binary here. And then it will run it for you, and it will collect, actually, all the information uh, necessary and aggregate all of that into an HTML report. Uh, also, you can define everything related to the experiment within a configuration file, as I said earlier. Uh, the configuration file is, in general, our way to go. It's uh, what we prefer. And you just provide, actually, one view with the uh, report level, because we have three report levels, one view, one, two, and three. And they all dig into the, um, the binary in a different way. So we have um, the most efficient, uh, less time consuming is the report one, the level one. And then the second and the third, they go much deeper into analysis and they take a lot more time. Actually, the overhead is, is quite substantial sometimes. But in this case, I was talking about the configuration file where you can specify actually all the variables and the environment and the application path and so on. And then one view will just um, read all that information that is available here and build the uh, experiment environment and run your application and create the uh, report um, in the end, the HTML report in the end. So the analysis here um, can be can be actually um, can be uh, tweaked if necessary. You can go into the configuration file and start specifying certain parameters. Like if you want to jump up a certain uh, piece of the, um, the execution time and so on, there are some some parameters that you can use with LProf to do so. Um, now one view can also reuse ex existing experiment directories to perform actually additional analysis, like. Uh, suppose you were running a program and then at some point you you you, uh, you you obtained actually a report. Well, you can provide one view um, with the the um, the uh, run directory that contains all the raw data of what happened during the execution. It will generate actually a either a comparison uh, or um, a complete HTML uh, report for you or a spreadsheet. So you can also have it actually in in spreadsheet format. It's just a, a matter of flag. You can look at the help uh, and figure out actually how to use one view to generate. Um, by default, it will generate an HTML file, but you can also use a specific switch or a parameter on the command line to generate a spreadsheet. Actually, is this runnable easily um, in a normal job scheduler? I mean, you're running MPI run directly, but uh, what if you need to embed this into a custom job script and you need to run S run or something like that? Yeah, we do have have actually a um, um, kind of like a, a layer that handles actually job schedulers. So for the time being, I think we only handle Slurm, and I think there was another batch manager. If Cedric can correct me here, because he worked on this much closely with the yeah. In theory, the, we we can handle uh, most job schedulers. Actually, uh, yeah. just as we have here an MPI command uh, in the example, for instance. We have similar commands that are uh, the um, uh, scheduler script and uh, the command for launching yeah. the, the scheduler script, the, the job scheduler, actually. The only constraint in that case is that we have to modify the job scheduler script to insert some specific keyword that uh, one view will then use when, uh, when launching the application. But otherwise, we were compatible with uh, most, uh, most uh, job schedulers. Yeah, I can show you actually what a what a configuration file looks like. I mean, I'm I've already reached the the uh, end of my presentation, so here you have actually the uh, other command lines that you can use to call actually lprof or cqa uh, in uh, in single mode. So instead of calling them through one view, because one view, as I said, is the master orchestrator of uh, of the modules, you can call the modules actually uh, uh, in single mode. So without having to generate actually all the report but they will of course generate actually much simpler reports they will just not be as dense as the reports that one view generates with all the information about the application 
But uh, let me show you what a, um, um, I mean, here you have a, the website where you can go download Macau and you can also look at the documentation. So we have um, many uh, PDF uh, tutorials available for you if you want to learn how to use the Lua API and write your own modules. Um, you can also see how you can use LProf and CQA in great detail. I mean, these here are just very simple, uh, basic actually examples, but if you want to see the details of how you can uh, create a configuration file and so on, I would recommend you go in through the documentation. Uh, we can go, you can go here, as I said, to download actually the binary release or clone the source code from the, the GitHub repository. And uh, uh, most of our publications are also available there if you're interested in, in looking actually at, uh, at what has been published around uh, Macau and using Macau. So let me show you actually um, a, uh, let me move this and I'm gonna bring a terminal around. We had actually um, a training session called VIHPS where we prepare actually um, uh, what we call hands-on sessions where most participants can actually take these examples and then run them on, on clusters and then get their hands dirty actually using Macau for profiling. And in here we have a set of configuration files where you can see here how we can run actually BT. So this is a pretty simple NAS parallel benchmark, so it's not a really complicated application, but this is just a, a hands-on session where you can get acquainted with how to um, organize your environment and how to uh, uh, configure Macau to run uh, behind a batch uh, scheduler. So in this case, you can see here that we're loading the modules and so on, um, and then specifying here uh, certain parameters that you can see uh, between these uh, these uh, these uh, brackets. So these parameters come actually from the config file of Macau. So we have here um, et, and it should be one view, and this is going to be the s batch. So here you can see actually what a configuration file looks like. Uh, you have to specify the binary uh, here. I know you can give a, your experiment a name if, if that is uh, if, if you're going to run multiple experiments. Actually, you might have multiple configuration files, so you might want to name them. Uh, if you have external libraries, you can specify them over the, over here. So if you depend on some MKL or a BLAST or so on, you can maybe specify it over there. And then the data set directory. So the path towards where the data set of your application is is uh, is being uh, is being actually uh, stored. Uh, the commands that you're gonna run uh, your program with. So if you have to pass some parameters, you might specify them actually over, over here, right next to the to the token. And this is a token. So you can see here that we do not use the name of the application anymore, btmz.c.x. We use actually this as a token, uh, actually in between these brackets, okay? So whenever you see uh, a variable being used like this, uh, or whenever you want to use a variable within the batch script that you're gonna um, call Slurm to run for you, you have to use actually these uh, this syntax so that Macau can fill up the void before the Slurm actually is being run. Okay, so this is the only actually kind of like tricky thing here is you need the configuration file for uh, for one view, and then you need the batch script to be compliant with what the configuration file uh, actually accepts as, as as variables and parameters. So in here, you can see also that when we're gonna run the program, we're gonna look for this batch script, so the BT Macau S batch, so this one particularly, we're gonna parse it, we're gonna update it uh, according to what's been defined here in the configuration file, and then this is the command that will be run, S batch, and we use the same token to reference actually the file. So uh, here we can define the number of processes, a uh, number of nodes, a number of processes per node, uh, all the parameters that you want to specify, the MPI run command, of course, uh, the number of open MP threads. So every parameter that you need to set for your program to run properly is being described here and is available for you to you know, configure properly according to what you want to do. And it's interfaceable, as I said, with, uh, with Slurm. But uh, in general, I don't think we had any issues. But most uh, clusters that we have tested Macau on uh, were running actually on Slurm. We've never had actually uh, to run on something. We, we maybe in the past had to run on something different, but um, it won't be actually difficult to include actually uh, a different batch manager uh, 
uh, if we have access to to a testing platform in this case yeah i think so, we we run in on, on pbs uh, a couple of times pbs well. yeah yeah pbs too oh. yeah. yeah those are the two actually that we have uh we have managed to run on and test so we know they work um if you're running some other batch manager and you would like us to support it well if you can give us access and we can t test our flow on it we most likely be uh, glad to port it on I mean, Cedric can correct me here. If I'm yeah, sure. Uh, normally, there shouldn't be much work to do to report it. Uh, probably, it should theoretically, theoretically work out of the right out of the box. Yeah. On any any job schedule, only only if there is some very specific part of, of the job schedule that that uh, that normally it should work out of the box. Yeah. So let me show you quickly here how we can run actually a uh, Macau. So I'm gonna go back to the directory that I set up earlier with the uh, as parallel benchmarks. So let me pick uh, one version and I can show you easily how, how you can run this. And then I'll show you quickly actually what a, a nice uh, dance report looks like. But this one is going to be quick and the report is not going to be containing I mean, something interesting. It's just going to be mainly uh, a bunch of functions and loops. But uh, we'll look at a different code that is much heavy and that has much more interesting actually um, uh, profiles to look at. But in general, what you need to do here is just um, install Macau. So what I do from my part is um, I either install actually the source the, the uh, source version because well I'm a Macau developer, so I have access to the source code, the complete source code. But you can also download the binary version and install it, for example, in the OPT Macau directory. So you can just download this tar uh, archive, extract it, and within it, you'll find actually the Macau binary. And you just move it here and you can set up your path. Like my path uh, variable here is set up with uh, slash OPT slash Macau. And this allows me actually to like run Macau actually from, uh, from my command line. So what I'll be doing here is running BTB and I'll just go with the Macau one view and then dash R1. So you can go with dash dash report equals one. Okay? Or you can also use this shortcut by using uh, capital R1, which means that you want uh, report level number one. And then specify the binary file. Well, in this case, it's going to be bt.b.x. And then here it goes. It will run. It will uh, finish up the profiling. And then it will generate actually a report in the end. But let me show you actually. Um, a report that is way interesting of a real HPC application. But you can see here that total application execution time was 142 seconds. So this is a, a uh, quantum Monte Carlo actually simulation. And uh, in here, you can see the general uh, global information about the application uh, runtime. So you can see here, for example, that we have a uh, array access efficiency of 63.36%, so which is not really that great. And we can also hear that we have potential speed ups for uh, two loops, for one loop here that can gain 43%, and we have eight loops that can gain uh, 29%. Oh, sorry, here, five loops that can gain 43%, and one loop that can gain 16%. So we can switch to the functions view. So here you can see. Um, for each and every one of those functions that we have in the application, uh, the coverage in percentage, and then we have the total execution time. So this one took 40% of the total execution time, which amounts to around 20 seconds. We can also open it up and see all the loops that are inside. And then we can also switch to the loops tab and see the hot loops. And we can clearly here um, locate the loop number uh, 30,945, that takes 25% of the execution time. So this is a very heavy hotspot, like the quarter of the ex execution time of the application is spent in here. So if you double click on this uh, loop, you'll have the uh, source code here on the left. Let me zoom in a bit on this. So you can see the source code here on the left, and this has been brought up using the uh, debug information provided by the, by the compiler at compile time. And you can clearly see here the CQA report with all the information about um, the vectorization. So this loop is peel tail of an unrolled vectorized loop. 
So it has detected that this loop is actually uh, a peel or a tail. And then you have all sorts of information here about the uh, loop patterns and what it's doing in terms of arithmetic operations and the amount of cycles it costs and how much speed up we can gain if we do actually vectorize this whole loop. So if you move to the potential speed ups uh, or potentials for this loop, it says that it detected two fused multiplier add operations inside, which makes sense. You can clearly see here that we have uh, subtractions and then multiplications and a subtraction can only be can be turned actually into a negative addition. And here we have hints about what can be done to, uh, well, the arithmetic intensity is very low. Uh, so this should be actually uh, increased by doing more operations uh, per byte, which means that maybe an enroll in this case could be beneficial for this loop. And if you look at the expert mode, you can see here the details about how your code flows, or this code in particular flows in the pipeline. So you can see each port of the pipeline being stressed and uh, being used. And in the end, you'll have an evaluation of um, cycles according to this um, to the machine model or the pipeline model related to the machine that you're targeting. So you can clearly see here the latency uh, of the division is quite high. It's between 10 and 20 cycles uh, because this code is performing actually a certain number of divisions in here. And all of the operations are performed in scalar mode. So this, not, this is not vectorized at all. And you have some additional information here about uh, what happens at the front end, the back end of the CPU, and uh, the out of order engine, and so on. But all of these are actually available for people who really want to dig deep within the architectural aspects of their code execution. They're not always necessary, but in some cases, it's it's really worth it to go dig into this to understand what's going on to figure out maybe a better enroll factor or better uh, co code organization that will yield better performance at some point. Um, for parallel codes, you can check the topology and you can see here if you run in, for example, on multiple nodes, uh, you'll see here that we're running on two different threads and uh, nothing more than that. But we can also look at different reports. We can go back and look at some different version. So, so this is the same report, but um, on a different version of the application. But we'll see exactly the same thing. So uh, here you have actually a, a broader view where you can see uh, more details about thread execution and the slice of time allocated to each and every one of the, the libraries and system layers that we're using. So here you can see in this pie chart that you have 8% of the time being consumed by system and then you have some math operations, a little bit of OpenMP, but most of the execution time, 91% of the code executed comes from the binary file. It does not come from external libraries or from any other um, other actually uh, runtime. So eventually here you can see the, the distribution of the time according to each and every one of these uh, categories of, uh, of uh, types of code or types of pattern. Like if you have memory, uh, for example, a lot of mallocs, a lot of memory uh, system calls when you'll find actually there at time attribute att attributed time actually in here and everything related to IO to P thread parallelism and so on. Well, this code is actually running OpenMP. So we can see here that OpenMP is, um, is very, uh, is active, but it's not really taken much time actually in the total execution runtime. So the OpenMP runtime is not really uh, that hungry in this case. And again, we can go back to the functions view. I mean, you have additional filters that I didn't really show, show you earlier. So here we can actually isolate functions from, from certain libraries. We can look at specific uh, library functions. For example, we can only isolate um, functions from the Intel MKL or from the OpenMP runtime. Or I mean, it, it's up to you depending on what you want to see. If you have a lot of functions here that do not interest you at some point, just you can remove them, filter them out. And uh, we can only remain uh, with a profile that contains only the binary, like we can just remove everything else so, and check all the modules and only keep the uh, binary related functions. So here, what you find is the effective code that is within the application and everything else that comes from external libraries has been removed. So you can clearly see here that we are here and this is the function that consumes most of the runtime and it goes back to that same loop that we looked at earlier in a different report this one. And in this case, earlier it was taking 25% of runtime. In this case, it takes around 33%. So the third of the execution time of the whole application. So um, I would recommend actually you run in 
uh, one view by yourselves, uh, download and actually the Macau version and try trying to test it on your laptop using any kind of code. Uh, maybe using the BT benchmark as a as a as an example first, but then maybe running it specifically on uh, your own application if you want to. Uh, and if you have any questions or if you have any requests, uh, feel free to email us, me, Emmanuel, or uh, or Cedric, and uh, we'll be very happy actually to help you and guide you with a. Uh, through a session, actually, uh, an optimization and profiling session using Macau with a much in-depth analysis on a specific application that you might know better, actually, and that we can do some interesting work on. So thanks, everyone. And if you have any questions, I'm, uh, I'm available.